everyone. My name is Dina from Seven Eagle Group. Happy Wednesday. Today we have Rick Walters, who is an Army veteran. He was an infantry or he was an operations sergeant and served as an infantryman in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Since then, he has transitioned out of the Army and is now an award-winning award filmmaker. He will be sharing his unique insights and perspectives on his transition and diverse career experiences. Thank you so much for joining us on Pay It Forward, Rick. Uh, so you, first, Thank what you. motivated you to pursue a career in the movie industry after transitioning out of the <laughs> Army? Uh, you know, it actually started while I was still in. Um, first off, thanks guys for doing this. It's nice to be here. Um, I did 14 years in, and, you know, I did seven years on the line as infantryman. I was an infantry scout, did all those things. But towards the end of my career, I, I was stationed at Joint Base Lewis McCord. I began working for Department of Plans Training, uh, Mobilization and Security, or DPTMS. It's like the garrison function at most, most installations now across the country. Uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord is an Army installation and an Air Force installation. And my job became to take care of like all of these theaters and multi-use auditoriums there. So I went from being, you know, a door kicker to an instructor to uh, a, a cadre at a schoolhouse to uh, basically a, a janitor. <laughs> so I had some time and I, I got to learn the logistics of, of things there. And I got to see some really cool creative artistic events that came to the installation through morale, welfare, and, re and recreation. So I started translating some, some stuff that was in me from early on in life in theater, maybe in high school and college. And those things became interesting to me again. So before I even got out of the, the military, while I was still JBLM, I began doing film projects, auditioning. I auditioned for a, a feature film and I got cast. I actually left work one day in my uniform. I was still in my pickle suit and I went up to Seattle and I auditioned for a movie and I got called back and I did the third one and they cast me and I got 16 days on that film. And that kind of like set, set the, the pace for the next 10 years or the last 15 years now that I'm looking at it. But yeah, um, it made sense. I had, I had some, some leadership skills that made me a good producer and first assistant director. So I just started working while I was still in, I got jobs on the weekends and uh, that just transferred over right when I got out. So I was just going to ask, how did your military experience influence your approach working oh, yeah. in the industry? Well, I, I first should say that the first guy I started collaborating with, I met on Craigslist. And he happened to be a former Marine. He's a little bit younger than me. His name's Chris Taylor. And he was founding a company up there at Joint Base Lewis McCord called Adventist Films. He was a, a camera guy in the Marines. I think they call it ComCam. Or, Combat uh, camera? Yeah. And so he was a journalist. He went to, to Dimfos in the military and he learned he learned how to do all that stuff, camera operating, writing, editing, the whole field process. So I was actually my friends were in a punk rock band and they were making a, a music video and they wanted me to direct it. I had no idea about directing or anything. So I got on a Craigslist and I found this guy. And it turns out he also worked in joint base with McCord for DPTMS as a DOD civilian. And he was doing camera stuff there. So we met each other, we hit it off and we started um, a conversation in military vernacular. So we knew, you know, how to square things away. <laughs> you know, right. so to speak. We spoke the it's same language. Lingo. And so he was getting gigs too, uh, in a side hustle. He owned, he owned equipment. So people were reaching out to him. He wanted to be a cinematographer. So he put himself in that sphere. People were hiring him to shoot their short films, et cetera, et cetera. He was on a project at the same time. And that project didn't have a first assistant director. So he's like, Hey, you know, uh, I'm doing this thing. You want to come be a first AD to which I replied, I have no idea what that is. So we just kind of figured it out. I went and did it and it turned out it's like being uh, an NCYC at a range right? or a top kick in a company or a platoon sergeant. It's like, this is the same thing, beans and bullets. And so um, I got, I got that really quick and that parlayed to another short film. And then before I knew it, I was producing a feature and that all happened within the first two years before I even got out of the army. So I think I, I, I got to tip my hat to Chris Taylor for out there, man. I'm sure you are up in Tacoma, Washington. You guys should talk to him, by the way. He's, he's a remarkable dude. He just started another business. But anyways, um, it was because of our military, common military experience that we collaborated so well. It's because we understood the, the beans and the bullets, the logistics, the scheduling, you know. And, and both of us had kind of punctuality and kind of a sense of duty. And those values play in well to doing creative stuff as well, you know, because it is a process of. So. I, I would say that um, meeting him, you know, 
I guess the message would be put yourself with like-minded people because um, I've seen in your guys' network, you have a lot of artists in your network, creatives, designers, etc. Um, that, that was really the catalyst that got me into the industry. It was somebody else who spoke my language and who knew the vernacular in the industry. So someone who is interested in going into this industry, what advice would you give them? Um, who are, what advice would you give transitioning military members who are just starting and kind of interested in pursuing a career in this, in this industry, either becoming an actor or a director or a yeah. producer, anything in that field? Immerse yourself. Like go, you know, don't listen to anybody else. Just go, like put yourself in a room, force yourself to talk to somebody else about those ideas, figure out what it takes to make it happen and then do it. That's really all it is. You know, work for free for the first three or five years of your experience in this industry. Um, and that's what it is. So have a good attitude about it. If you have a good attitude and you're passionate, other people will see that and they, they will pair their passion and good attitudes and you guys will move forward towards, you know, solving a bunch of complex and stimulating problems. So uh, that's it, period. Uh, there's a lot of veterans groups I've been a member of. I've started groups. Uh, the Warrior Film um, Project was something I started early on. The, the objective to become a 501c3 to provide infrastructure for other people to do it. But I found that that, you know, when you're an artist, you have to have your own impetus. Right. You have to find what your voice is and then you have to yell until people hear it. And then uh, I know that doesn't help until people get their own contextual practical experience, but that really is what it is. Get on Craigslist, have a meeting with someone, tell them what your ideas are, hear what their ideas are, try, fail. Like those things are serious, are serious stepping stones in doing this whole thing. Right. Um, I will then say you have a GI bill. If you have the post 9-11 GI bill, I went over from the Montgomery GI bill to the post 9-11 GI bill midway through uh, my benefit. And because of it, I lost like a, an incredible amount of my benefit right. and I regret that so plan how you use your GI Bill there are schools out there if you want to be in my industry that will give you equipment and exposure uh, USC in Los Angeles NYU New York many accredited schools I'm not a school guy I do terrible in the classroom so I would prefer to go out and just do it practically but with the GI Bill you can get labs you can get uh, access to equipment to where you can go out and do it yourself so at the very least you will learn the vocabulary You'll make some uh, of those connections, those relationships. And uh, some of those relationships from school will be more valuable than any celebrity you'll ever meet because they will have that passion and that attitude that is the key success factor in your own art. Right. So being able to cultivate those relationships and uh, keep a good attitude. Um, I will say, uh, hopefully not an overshare here, but I'm 90% disabled. I have post-traumatic stress disorder. I have a lot of mental health issues on my own. And I've been using my artwork to, uh, as a catharsis, as a, a conduit between me and my trauma. And that has so many upsides. It has a lot of downsides too. The journey since 2013 for me has been a rocky one. So I go back to attitude. Your attitude is regardless of how you're feeling, you know, I have all of my limbs, I have all of my fingers, I can hear out of one of my ears still, you know, there's things that are, I got going for me that other people don't. But I can also introduce you to people in uh, Ward 57, who are missing all of those things, but still mm -hmm. smile in the morning when, they, when you see them, that will still be excited about doing something fun, that can still experience happiness, you know, in their in their state. So that attitude is really what it is. If you have a good attitude, your passion, your ideas will come come through it. You know, so over those thirteen years, I've had to do a lot to maintain that attitude. It includes therapy, includes exercise, fitness, all those things that that, that you already know. Uh, all that stuff is real. And in order to have those healthy relationships with other people who are passionate and have good attitudes, you have to live in that space. So put yourself in that space and let that be your priority among everything else is keep a good attitude whatever it takes to have that good attitude do it do that that's awesome thank you so much for sharing that we really appreciate how personal um we get with these um meetings because we get to learn other people's experiences and see how it affects everybody um and you're completely right attitude is everything it's 100 percent of how you approach things um so going in with a good attitude how would you say 
is the right way to navigate such a complex and competitive industry because there's so many studios, there's so many uh, positions to to go into. Um, how would you say is the best way to contact people or show people what you're capable of doing when you don't have necessarily a lot of experience in combat camera or editing or film, uh, but you would like to go into that without... Um, if somebody doesn't have their GI Bill or somebody is looking for just resources uh, that they can use to to get into the, this industry? Well, luckily, it's becoming easier and easier and easier. And the industry is flattening out, meaning that up here used to be these these studios, these tentpole movie makers, and then these networks, these TV networks, and these cable networks, and then all of these big corporate companies and commercial companies. But now, you know, in, the, in this day and age, you can become your own studio, network, a content creator. So the barrier to entry is, is far less now than it, than it ever has been. So I'll go back to the word immersion. You have to immerse yourself. There are a lot of different communities online. What I remember starting out is I was very eager. I asked a lot of questions. I went to every single social event I could possibly go to. Um, and I started trying to build a rapport with people before I even knew who they were, what their function was in the industry just because I wanted to build relationships. That worked for me, but it also worked against me in a lot of different ways because I had nothing to show for it. Like I'd go to these, these events and I had, you know, a business card, but I had no content. I had nothing, you know? So really uh, right now, the best thing to do is, is discover what it is you want to do. Then find those people. You'll find them on social media. You'll find them on meetup. You'll find them um, in different forums and just listen, observe. When you uh, go to battle staff, you take any leadership school in the army, they'll talk about uh, arriving at a new unit. When you're taking over a platoon, for example, one of the one, the very first thing you do um, in integrating into your unit is observe. Just listen. Put your put your ear to the ground or social media, what have you. See how people are are, are discussing things. Watch how people react to other questions. You know, you'll see. A lot of people, when they get in the early part of their career, once they kind of start figuring out what they're doing, they start criticizing people who are just where they were. So right. get on and ask questions, and someone will make you feel really small because of what a dumb question that was. But in truth, those people are also lost. So take everything with a grain of salt, be patient, have a good attitude, and be persistent. But most importantly, listen and observe because you're going to find your own answers. You can get on YouTube right now and learn how to make a film from start to finish without speaking to another person. Right. You can take your cell phone and the equipment you have and do it right now with nobody else. And it's doable. And if you have no idea how to do that, how to sync audio, how to shoot, how to capture the media, how to process it, edit it, finish it, color it, anything, you can find it on YouTube. So do it at any level, at any time. If you want to enter into it, do it at any level at any time with what you have with you. That is is the best, the best advice I could give you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I see that you're a director currently and you're working on a documentary called The River. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, that was my first commission as a director. So um, talk about career progression. That was huge for me because um, it makes me eligible to enter the Directors Guild. So now if I were to pay the initiation fee and then get another job, you know, I could work as a, as a director in the union. Right now, the unions are not very friendly, unfortunately, because there's an industry-wide strike from the Writers Guild. But, uh, yeah, the, the, another overshare, personally, before I went in the military, I spent some time uh, living living in the school of hard knocks, if you will. I lived on the street. I was a ruffian of sorts and had a hard time. It involved, it, it involved uh, mental health. It involved drug addiction, involved many other things. I'm talking 17 through 19, maybe. I went into the military when I was 23, 47 now. So a lot of time has passed, but that time became very formative for me. Like a lot, a lot happened then. Uh, and uh, after I, kind of cut my teeth, got my 10,000 hours in this filmmaking thing. I began to build a name for myself in the local community in Seattle. A producer reached out to me, having heard my story at a, uh, a talk. I did a talk for the Seattle Film School. They did this Coffee Tuesdays thing. But anyways, uh, 
I went up and I, I kind of exposed my story and a couple of people there were listening to it. One of those people found me and approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in directing a documentary. And it just so happened that documentary, the subject matter was in a small town in Washington state that I'm really noisy here. I apologize. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, there's a small town in, in Washington called Aberdeen. It's a, it's a river town and it used to be a really important mill town because it was like where all the wood was packaged and bundled out of Washington state and shipped out into the Pacific Ocean to all of its different places. That mill was shut down in the early 1900s, causing this town to depress. And it became what's called a sanctuary city. I'm sorry that the noise is over almost, I promise. We can hear you. It's perfect. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, anyways, it became what was called a sanctuary city. And because of this, the this, this state started sending all of its people who were in need to the city because there were resources that were left there in the vacuum that this mill left behind. So that because of this e economic depression, it, it became kind of a haven for homelessness. So people get on the rails and they want to get out of the met metropolitan area and go somewhere central with an ocean view. They went to Aberdeen. So there was an encampment there that started developing and in, in the 40s, maybe. And then in the recent history, it became unmanageable, just untenable. 300, 400 people, murder, rape, many other things uh, that were happening. So the city began to take action to sweep it. Now, that's where I came into the picture. I, I was asked by Heather Olson, a producer in Seattle, if I would come and put my experience, my personal experience on this because I was homeless because I'm a filmmaker, et cetera, et cetera. I also happen to be very close friends. My very first team leader in the army at Fort Drum, New York in the 10th Mountain Infantry Division in the AT platoon was Sergeant Jason Capps. And he happened to be the police officer of the year <laughs> in Aberdeen the year prior to me making this film. So uh, he got me unprecedented access to the police department, the mayor, the uh, city council, the chief of police, and then also I got to ride along with him and hear his like point of view on this and get to see how he interacted with homeless people. So it became a very valuable thing. My military connection uh, became a very, a very valuable part of that. He's also a very pious man. He's a family man. So uh, old school conservative values can compare to me kind of being a ruffian artist type. So it was a good compositional like thing. But anyways, all of it stemmed from my personal experience and then the technical parts of it, the shooting it became easy because I've been learning that most of it for free by working for free in other people's work. But um, I got I got a an equipment um, budget. I got a lodging budget, a travel budget, a post budget, um, and then we did some crowdfunding also and and earned an additional ten thousand dollars to finish the movie. It's since been distributed and it's now on Amazon. It's made money. <laughs> it's crazy and it's also in schools, it's being used in curriculum as an educational piece, which was my goal from the very beginning was to open a dialogue without being political, without saying this side, this side, anything. It's like here are all the sides now, now discuss this and kind of did it. So I was able for the first time use my craft to convey a message. And, and uh, that's led to some other projects since then too, thankfully. That's such a great accomplishment, especially for anyone who's transitioning out of the military and doesn't have a lot of experience in this to see that they motivate themselves, that they can become something um, big and end up even in curriculum at schools and just work with a lot of different people and network. Um, I also you were talking about how you were an actor. So you've done um, some theater work and some on screen work. Is that right? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm a SAG after actor. I have a card and everything. I've, I've done TV work, you know, I've done not really background work, but featured extra work and guest star work on TV. I haven't done anything in LA since I've been here. So I, I've been going to three corners, you know, Seattle, New York, New Jersey, LA. So I've been working those three, three different spots. But during the pandemic, I moved to LA and I've kind of been here. And, and you know, just to stay working, I, I joined the Teamsters, the local 399. Uh, and I'm doing locations here. You know, I was an infantry scout. I'm a location scout now. So it's it's kind of fit well. Oddly enough, I do a lot of the same awesome. things. What, so, what were you? Were you in the Air Force or Marines? What were Marine you? Marine Corps. 
I, okay. I was in the Marine Corps. I had I'm in the communications field. I had two MOSs, network administrator and network transport technician. The second Excellent. one was more like fiber optics. Um, I loved it. It's awesome. Uh, nice. I did four years. Or I'm I'm still in uh, my last few years, but on my I'm on my skill bridge now, um, and I learned so much from it. It's been so great. Cool. What well, What do you want to do? Uh, so I while I was in the Marine Corps, I used my tuition assistance, and I was in college. So I studied for my associate's marketing and business, and I'm currently working on my architectural degree. Wow. Cool. Yeah. But before then, I had something kind of like a mini podcast on YouTube. Um, where I interviewed young entrepreneurs. So it's, I really like this field anywhere, like in the movie industry or that, directing, producing, interviewing. Uh, I just, I feel like I have a, a good fit for it. Yeah. Well, you're very, you're, you're a great speaker and conversationalist. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank lead, you so much. Leading conversation. Okay. So that's another good point. Like how, how do you, how do you, uh, once you finally get to meet somebody, you know, exchange valuable information. You know, the first rule is listen. So take the information, first of all, keep it, whether you process it, understand it and apply it right away, doesn't matter, but retain it, copy it, record it, write it down, whatever you have to do. That's very important. But being able to speak and articulate your ideas or your level of understanding. So I, I mentioned my friend, Chris, my friend, Chris, an old school, pragmatic Florida, Florida guy, bunch of brothers, as a dad, he was a, you know, hardcore dad, whatever. So he's like all business, like no, no pat on the back kind of guy, you know, but when it came time for us to start doing more creative things, and I was wanting to switch over from being a first assistant director and a producer to being a creative, I wanted to be a director. I wanted to write and direct people and I had never done it before. So I didn't know if I could or not, but I mean, I was going to fake until I make it, but that wasn't good enough for Chris. What Chris wanted, and this is my partner and technically my best friend, you know, but what he wanted is for me to uh, demonstrate confidence. Hmm. He wanted me to be confident and he wanted me to focus on one thing instead of doing all these different things, which I'm very good at doing. He wanted me to focus on that one thing and do it elegantly and execute it efficiently, you know, without spending a bunch of money or, or, and uh, that really pissed me off. <laughs> I can do I can do all these things. I can literally do all these things. But over time I've I've learned that that's very important that you have to be able to focus all of your energy on one thing and we know this in the military that there are military occupational specialties because that division of labor is required in order for one soldier, marine, airman to do that job and to be able to report up and down, you know, no two levels up, no two levels down what that job is. So yes, you can operate the camera. Yes, you can run sound. Or yes, you can do your own makeup or whatever, but don't because somebody else is going to do that and they're right. going to make sure that it's continuous throughout the entire process and just that so you can focus on your lane so that was a, another key thing is know your lane well enough to be confident about it and when you're talking to people be able to communicate that confidence and that's what you did for me when I first met you so good job oh thank you I appreciate that <laughs> so I feel like in the military, we're pulled 10 different ways. So we're good at multitasking. But I see I see his point about focusing on one thing because it can excel so much larger than if we multitask and get everything done. But it's done to a, a minimalistic or like a, a minimum, like a standard. It's to, it's, yeah, to a standard. Under those conditions to a standard, but not often as it excelled, you know, Correct. or exceeded. Yeah, you're Correct. right. Well, that that's a cultural thing. And that's one thing I love about the creative industry is that there's nobody in the creative industry who is not passionate about it. There are people who get burnt out and then you'll see what they look like, but they're waiting to get to the standard so they can apply all of their creativity. You know what I mean? You're right. So that's and why you want to deal with other people with that attitude, you know? Right. That's where excellence comes from. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, one thing to go back, you said uh, you were a location or location scout right in the army for like the infantry infantry scout yeah so okay. so there's a lot of different types of scouts recon you know different level resources i'm a battalion level so times 250 350 guys for four companies including a, a headquarter element and headquarters will have like heavy heavy weapons um anti-tank and then we'll have a scout platoon and the scout platoon is the time commander's eyes and ears on the battlefield so uh yeah i was an infantry scout and we were doing stuff like uh I can still remember, and I got out in 2013, but 
the different reports we do, you know, we'd have a, each team, we'd have four teams, each team would have a sniper and a sniper spotter. And we go out and do a recon, you know, we do a, a salute report, size, activity, right. location, uniform, time, and equipment, like that basic stuff. They have really good notes, take good pictures from all different angles, and then report that back to the commander. Oddly enough, that's exactly what a location scout does for, for film and television. And so when I was in, in New York, I accidentally got a job on a TV show in the locations department. And this is before they were unionized. Um, it was called Mozart in the Jungle. I think it's 2016, 2017, maybe. And uh, they asked me to come back the next day and the next day. So I stayed on the whole season. And uh, the next show I got on was Power. Uh, it was a star show uh, for 50 Cent. Curse Jackson. And while I was on that show for that season, we got folded into the 817, which was a, a, a union over there. So I became a teamster. So um, after becoming uh, in getting into it, I, I kind of worked my way up to scout, which is kind of mid mid level in the locations industry. And I began doing scouting for TV shows. So um, yeah, it, it's pretty cool. It, it is actually pretty cool as you work with yourself drive out you know you work 10 hours a day as long as there's sunlight you spend a lot of time on your laptop editing photos and, and organizing stuff but pretty dang interesting that i was a infantry scout and then, a and then it trans scout. yeah that was so cool so i i i caught that when you were talking about it i was like wow that's what you did at, on the civilian sector too that's awesome yeah um yeah. can you tell us about any upcoming projects or roles um that you're particularly particularly excited about well you know, uh, I, I've been working in TV, so I've been doing other people's passion projects, you know, like I just got off the television show Dave season three, you can see that that's on now. Uh, I worked on it on a show called um, Daisy Jones and the Six, which is on Amazon, you can see that now. The Dropout is on Hulu, you can see that now. Um, another show with Jennifer Gardner in it. Um, can't remember the name, it's called Sausalito when we were making it, but that just came out, that's out right now. So there's a lot of TV shows that I worked on that were other people's projects, you know. But of my own, I'm doing a lot of different stuff. I, uh, I'm a writer, and, and, and maybe it's a good time um, just to back up. When I got when I'm still in the Army, I got a scholarship to go to the Seattle Film School from this organization called the Red Badge Project. Tom Skerritt, um, you know Tom Skerritt, uh, he started this project with a couple other folks, including a guy named Warren Etheridge, John Jacobson, and some other like high-level professor in literature and filmmaking. They went to Joint Base Lewis McCord and offered screenwriting classes, acting classes. Like I got acting classes from Tom Skerritt. Oh wow! <laughs> and and uh, and uh, that was my bridge because they got me a scholarship to their their um, certificate program at the Seattle Film School. Where I did screenwriting, where uh, that's how I got to do that that talk. I was invited on a series to do a speaker series with Stuart Stern famous he was actually a world war ii infantryman but he's also a famous screenwriter did sybil rebel without a cause like like all of those things james dean's uh confidant back in the day um but we were on the same panel together talking about our veteran experience and how it relates to storytelling and filmmaking that's where heather pilder olson heard me speak and that's how i got the job to do the river so those those connections started from that red badge project so writing where, where I really believe my future in, as a content creator will, will depend on is my ability to write or to create content or ideate it and then articulate it at the very least, you know, right. uh, came from that, that opportunity that the Red Badge Project gave me. So the Red Badge Project, I think, is nationwide. Like through them, I made it to uh, Walter Reed and Bethesda in Washington, D.C. I was connected with different different people to make documentary stuff, um, Operation Ward 57, a uh, bunch of other different veteran veteran organizations that came from that experience. So if you're a veteran and you're watching and you want to get into the industry, no matter what you want to do, look up the Red Badge Project. It's a screenwriting school, but they have their, their tendrils out into the industry. So it's a great bridge, if you will. But um, back to the original question, writing, I think... Um, I guess so tangential. What was your original question? Uh, <laughs> if you have any projects coming up, yeah. any projects or roles coming up. <laughs> yes. So I'm writing. I'm writing right now. Um, because there's a strike right now, 
Uh, there's no TV being filmed or anything. There's commercial work. And, you know, I, I, I'm also a photographer and a videographer. So I, it's my side hustle. I'll take up, I'll take up small projects and do that stuff on my own, but I'm writing, I'm writing a comedy series. Um, I recently got asked to do a, um, I, I, I don't know, it's like 700,000 words, uh, for a novel. Uh, it's, it's by an author named Warren, Warren Etheridge is compiling short stories from veterans. Uh, about their experience different you know from different perspectives um oddly enough i've been invited to speak like this on a lot of different podcasts people people like hearing people blab i suppose but um i'm getting i'm getting speakers speaking roles too oddly enough so there's all that stuff happening i'm i'm volunteering at a school as a, a teacher's assistant in acting for young folks which i dig and I'm always doing my warrior film project. And that is just to kind of fostering different relationships like this, mm -hmm. saying, hey, what do you need? And trying to give it to people, offering consultancy and all that stuff. Um, yeah. So hopefully one of these movies that I'm writing, I'll be making this year. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And congratulations yeah. on the scholarship. That's such an accomplishment. And for all your hard work um, in and out of the service. And thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing your valuable insights with us and for uh and, and sharing your experiences with our audiences. It's been a pleasure you pleasure having you on Pay It Forward and thank you so much again. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks guys. Take care, Rick. Thank you. You too. Bye bye.